And so this is our chapter on voting and political participation. So and this is a really relevant chapter this year because, you know, we have the presidential election coming up. And so we're going to talk about some of, you know, the ins and outs of how Americans can be part of democracy and part of the political process. So there's three main ways that people can get involved with uh, participating in the political process. First and foremost is voting. Voting is the most uh, important way we have to influence the uh, the system that, that governs us. And so, you know, we have to fight against that urge. You know, there are a lot of people that say, oh, my vote doesn't matter. One vote doesn't matter, et cetera, et cetera. We can't really think of, about it that way. One vote can matter quite a bit, uh, especially when we're talking about our state and local elections. A lot of times those races can be decided by a handful of votes. Um, <clears throat> when we're talking about the big elections like president and things like that, we can't really think of it as just my vote. You have to think of your vote coupled with the votes of everyone else who's voting the same way you are. And so if everyone who thinks their vote doesn't matter actually gets out to vote, it can completely change the outcome of an election. So voting is important. Uh, it is our most important uh, way of influencing our government. Uh, two and three kind of go hand in hand, volunteering. Um, a lot of people will get involved with causes that they care about or with candidates that they are really drawn to. I know back in 2018, uh, I had a lot of students who were getting involved with Beto O'Rourke's campaign. Um, <clears throat> when I was in doing my undergrad at UNT, uh, when President Obama ran for president the first time, a lot of students were fired up and getting involved in President Obama's campaign. And a lot of times, you know, the, the candidates like that can really speak to young voters and get them really fired up to be involved in the process. And so volunteering your time for a particular cause or a particular candidate, those are other ways that um, you can really have some influence on the way things turn out. Um, <clears throat> protest. We've been seeing a lot of protests this year. Um, protest is our most direct way of signaling to government what our feelings are. Um, you know, the First Amendment gives us the right to assemble crowds to express our displeasure with the state of things in our country, whether it's a cause, an elected official, you know, something we want to see changed. You know, we, we've seen the Black Lives Matters, uh, Black Lives Matter protests this, uh, this year, you know, in very large numbers because of George Floyd and what happened. Um, we've seen people protesting the government because of the lockdown, because of COVID and things like that. So protest, you know, the more people that take to the streets, it really sends a message. If you have five people out there protesting, it doesn't send a strong message. But if you look at what happened after George Floyd, we had, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in cities all across America and even in other countries marching to express their dissatisfaction with the way things are happening in our country. So that sends a strong message to elected officials that, hey, you need to, we need some things to change or we're going to hold you accountable for it. So protest is a very powerful thing and something that is protected under the First Amendment. Um, sometimes you'll hear the phrase suffrage. That just means the right to vote. Uh, we talk a lot about women's suffrage and African-American suffrage and things like that. And that's just the struggle for the right to vote. And then, of course, today, uh, because of the Internet and social media, we have digital political participation. Um, the Internet has really become a tool and social media has become a tool for organizing people. A lot of these protests that took place this uh, this year uh, and some of the things that have happened in the past, like the Arab Spring and things like that, were all organized online through social media, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, things like that. It's a, it's a really powerful tool to bring people together and connect with people um, you know, who share the same idea as, as you, and you can organize protests, organize letter writing campaigns, you know, they have like automatic programs now that you can send a text to, and it'll automatically write your senators or your Congress people for you. Uh, we have the 
you know, the, the digital petitions online and everything. So the internet has really made it easier to uh, send direct messages to our elected officials. Um, <clears throat> and so looking here to the right, uh, this is just a snapshot of social media, the, the use of social media, um, you know, from 2010 to 2014. So this is still under uh, President Obama, but this is the increase uh, of the use of social media in these different age demographics uh, in how they um, follow candidates who run for office, follow political parties, um, you know, particular causes. And you can see from 2010 to 2014, social media engagement increased drastically in all categories across the board. So it really has changed how uh, we get involved in the political process. Now, looking at the election, um, you know, elections are, you know, the way that we express our desire for change. And so part of being a democracy, a Republican democracy, we have regular and free elections so that we, the people, uh, can mobilize and influence the actions of government, change who our leaders are when we want to see things change, all that kind of stuff. And so here's these are some uh, terms having to do with elections that you're going to hear a lot about uh, as we get closer and closer to the election. So you'll hear people refer to the electorate. And when they're talking about the electorate, that's just all of the citizens who are eligible to vote. You know, you'll hear, uh, if you listen to Joe Biden or you listen to Donald Trump, you'll hear them say, you know, the electorate is, is asking for this. The electorate wants to see change, yada, yada, yada. They're talking about citizens who are eligible to vote, that, that the people want to see change. And then oftentimes when you see a party win overwhelmingly, they'll say that they have a mandate from the people. And what that means is because they win so overwhelmingly, they're essentially saying that the people have their, they have spoken and they want to see the change that this party has demanded. And so if you look back when uh, President Obama was elected in 2008, uh, the Democrats took the presidency and they took uh, the Senate. And so, you know, the, the Democratic Party said, you know, we have a mandate from the people. They have obviously voted us into power and they want to see us create change based on what we have proposed. Um, same thing in 2016. When Donald Trump comes into office, he controls the Republicans control the presidency, the Senate and the House. Um, and so you know, that's a, a very strong mandate from the people. But then in 2008, they lose the House. And just like President Obama in uh, 2010, you know, they lost the Senate. So it's not like it's a uniform kind of uh, permission to do whatever you want. You still have to keep the voters happy. Um, and then we, we, we split our election into two stages. Uh, the primary is what took place in March. And so in the primary election, we have multiple candidates who are win who are running for the same office. So if you remember, the Democrats had like 25 people who were running for the presidential nomination. Uh, in the primary election, we vote among those candidates to narrow them down to one. And so after primary season, Joe Biden emerged as the front runner and became the nominee for the Democratic Party. Um, the general election is then where the parties run head to head. So we have Joe Biden for the Democrats versus Donald Trump for the Republicans. Um, some states do this a little differently. Uh, some states have a closed primary where if you are a registered Republican or a registered Democrat, uh, you have to vote in your party's primary. Here in Texas, we have what's called an open primary, which means you can decide on the day of the primary election which party's primary you want to vote in, but you have to pick one or the other. Um, and this opens up a strategy called crossover voting, where someone who might be a diehard Republican will vote in the Democratic primary as a way to try and sabotage the outcome of their election. But it, it doesn't really work because there's just not enough people who vote in this way to cause uh, a significant influence on that process. And then a runoff primary is if we get a, if we get 
uh, a situation where we have multiple candidates and nobody gets the majority of the vote, then we have to have a runoff to see who will take that position. The general election, like I said, once we've narrowed all our <clears throat> candidates down to one, then in the general election, they go head to head, whether it's for president, senator, judge, whatever it is, we have a Democrat, a Republican, and then in some cases, a third party as well. Whoever wins the general election gets to take that office. Um, and when you go vote, you're going to be voting in multiple levels of elections. We're going to be voting for national level, which is the president, and we're going to be electing a senator from the state of Texas. Then we have state and county and local elections as well. And so one of the biggest complaints today about voting is that we vote for so many things at one time that our election can seem a little overwhelming. Um, but I do urge you to, to at least vote in all of those races. Even if you're not super motivated to vote in the presidential election, you should vote in your local and your state elections because what happens at those levels will affect you more on a day-to-day -day basis than what happens at the national level. So even if you're not super motivated to vote for one of these presidential candidates, I urge you to still vote in state and local and things like that. And then sometimes on the ballot, you'll see initiatives and referendums. And these are essentially ways that uh, citizens can essentially create uh, amendments to the constitution or ideas that they want to see enacted and they can start a petition and get enough signatures to get initiatives put on the ballot, whether it's to change, you know, education or the environment or whatever it is. Um, this is a way that citizens can have direct influence by putting these measures on the ballot. And the process differs from state to state, um, you know, but if something gets put on the ballot as an initiative or a referendum, um, you know, then the, the the local legislature has to take those issues up and take them into consideration. Um, some of the, the criticisms of this process is that a lot of times a, a single wealthy person or an interest group can bankroll these efforts, but that doesn't mean that there aren't citizens out there that really care about these issues. Um, and then there's also recall elections sometimes. We don't have those in Texas. But some states do. Um, a recall essentially is a special election to remove someone from office. If there is, this has happened in California. This is actually how Arnold Schwarzenegger became governor. Um, if they elect a, uh, let's say in, in California, they elected a governor and they were not happy with the job this governor was doing. They felt that he was kind of running the state into the ground, uh, that he was incompetent and things like that. So if enough citizens sign a petition to start a recall, then they will have a special election where they can remove that person from office because they don't believe that they're doing a, a good job. And so once they recalled the governor, a bunch of people uh, threw their name in to run as that governor's replacement, and Arnold Schwarzenegger was one of those. And so that's how he was elected governor in California. So this just is kind of a picture of the primary versus the general in 2016. In the primary, we had all of these people running for the Republican nomination. And of course, it got narrowed down to Donald Trump, who became the nominee for the Republican Party. And then the same for the Democrats in 2016. We had five candidates. Of course, the biggest uh, rivalry was between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. Uh, Clinton wins and she becomes the nominee in the general election. Um, you know, this year it was the, the roles were reversed and Trump didn't have to run a primary because he's the incumbent president, but we had like 25 Democrats and they were narrowed down to one, which is, uh, Joe Biden this year. Now, <clears throat> uh, presidential elections are a little different than other elections because there's different rules that govern the presidential election. Um, most states use an election uh, where, uh, like in Texas, we have what's called a winner-take-all primary. So whichever candidate gets the most votes takes that position. And this is the method that is preferred by Republicans. It can vary from state to state, but Republicans like a winner-take-all situation. You get the most votes, you win. Uh, proportional uh, representation is where 
uh, votes are casted or votes are casted and then delegates are awarded based on percentages. And then whoever has the most delegates at the end of the primary gets the nomination. And this is the system that Democrats prefer. Uh, and this is what caused all the controversy in 2016 was people felt like Sanders should have gotten more delegates than he than he got. And it caused a lot of controversy. And then we have uh, some weird states that still use the caucus system, most notably Iowa. Uh, in a caucus system, on a single day, they hold big meetings all over the state. Participants show up. They're usually in, in really big locations like civic centers or high school gyms or wherever. And the people in the room essentially choose sides for which candidate they're going to support. They spend time trying to campaign to other people. And essentially you have people split up. Like we have this group over in this corner. And if you're over here, you're supporting Bernie Sanders. If you're over here, you're supporting Joe Biden. If you're over here, you're supporting Kamala Harris, you know, things like that. And at the end, when time runs out, they count how many people are in each group and they award delegates based on who has the most people in their group. Um, but the meetings give people a chance to kind of make speeches, argue for why you should support this candidate and not that candidate. Um, it's a very old system. And it made sense in the 1800s when, you know, there might be a few hundred or a few thousand people in a location. But it's much tougher in the modern era where because it, it only takes place on one day at one particular time, which is usually a weekday. Um, so if you don't have child care or you have to work or things like that, then you essentially don't get to participate. And then, you know, trying to get, if a lot of people turn out, you know, what are you going to do with all those people? So it is an outdated system, but it does get a lot of attention in Iowa because they're the first state to hold their primary through the caucus. Um, the biggest shift that we've seen, though, is from states getting rid of the caucus and switching to primary voting like we have here in Texas. Uh, in, as, in like 2012, we had 37 states that used a primary election. I think that has increased to around 40 today. Um, and then front loading is just the idea that the, the states fight over who gets to go first. Um, you know, there's an advantage to being first because your state gets a lot of attention. Uh, the caucus process that happens in Iowa, you know, all the media, converges on Iowa to cover this process. And one of the effects it can have is based on who wins your state, if you go first, that can influence how people vote in the states that follow you. So let's say we're coming out of the caucus in Iowa and Joe Biden is the leader. So that may, uh, you know, people in the next 10 states see that Joe Biden was able to win that may make it appear like he's the most viable candidate and people may change their votes based on the outcome of these early states. So there is definitely an advantage to going as early as possible. The Electoral College. <clears throat> so again, like I said, this is probably one of the most confusing parts of our, our presidential election process. But, um, you know, the, the Electoral College, it, it was developed by our founding fathers to essentially, you know, create a barrier between the people and the president. And their original idea was to have Congress elect the president. And some of the founding fathers didn't like that idea. They thought that the people should directly elect the president. Um, one of the arguments against that was if someone who was tyrannical or bad for the country, but very charismatic and persuasive, could uh, convince the people to support them, then they could get elected president. So the founding fathers wanted there to be kind of a degree of separation between the people and the presidency. So this is where the Electoral College comes in. So each state is, it has a certain number of Electoral College votes, and that number is determined by the number of House reps you have, plus your two senators. So here in Texas, we have 38 Electoral College votes. We have 36 representatives and two senators. Um, so we have people who are called electors who cast those votes based on what the popular vote is in the state. So if 
uh, in 2016, Donald Trump won the popular vote in Texas. So he got all 38 electoral college votes from the state of Texas. To win the presidency, there's 538 total electoral college votes. And to win the presidency, uh, you have to get 270. Once one candidate gets 270, it is not possible for the other candidate to win. So um, that's how the electoral college works. Now, this is a winner-take-all system. So no matter what the percentages are, the one the, the candidate with the highest number of votes gets those votes. And so there's there's been some talk of maybe we should reform this process. And we'll look at that in just a minute. Um, reapportionment is what's about to happen uh, in our states. Every 10 years, we do the census. So we're doing the census this year. Um, and based on the outcome of the census, you know, population numbers, uh, we shift around the number of uh, seats in the House that we have. So some states may pick up seats, some states may lose seats. Uh, it never exceeds 435. That is the total number of seats in the House. Um, so based on the census, uh, and this is why we do the census, because it determines the amount of representation that the states have in the House. Um, the Electoral College, you know, it's been controversial since it was created. Um, the idea was that the Electoral College would produce a system where political parties didn't matter and we would get a nonpartisan president. That has not been the case. Um, you know, we've had the biggest critiques we've had of the Electoral College are a candidate getting the majority of the votes in our country, but not getting the electoral college votes. And of course, the first time, or the this is the second time it actually happened, but in recent history, uh, this happened in 2000. Uh, Al Gore won the popular vote. Uh, he had about uh, a million and some, and some change more votes than George W. Bush. Um, so in the popular vote, Al Gore gets 48.38%. George Bush gets 47.87%. But George Bush gets 271 electoral college votes, and Al Gore gets 266. So <clears throat> the problem that this, you know, that this makes apparent is that you can get the most votes nationwide, but the way the votes are split up in the electoral college you can win the Electoral College without winning the popular vote. And so you can look at the states and you can see that all of this red area is, you know, it hasn't changed a whole lot. We've got a few more blue states uh, like Nevada and places over here. Um, <clears throat> but this happened again in 2016 uh, by a bigger margin. Hillary Clinton got... 3 million more votes than Donald Trump, but Donald Trump was able to win the Electoral College. And the argument is that the Electoral College gives too much influence <clears throat> to states that people don't live in. So the majority of the population of our country lives on the coast and Texas, you know, based on population. And so all of these little states, they don't have a lot of electoral college votes, but if you put them all together, they can add up. And so, whereas California, you know, there's more people in California than any other state. So they have 54 electoral college votes, but you can win enough of these little states to cancel out California. There's not a lot of people that live in these states. And so the argument is, is that this gives too much influence to those rural states where people don't actually live. And our economy is pretty much driven by the states on the coast and, and a state like Texas. And so there's a lot of ideas out there to reform this process. One is to get rid of it and just go to the, the popular vote. The other is to use that proportional system where these electoral college votes are split up based on percentages. And then it would make every state competitive because presidential candidates could have the chance of getting electoral college votes from every single state. 
So it would actually make the process more competitive and force the candidates to actually campaign in all 50 states. Congressional elections, <clears throat> they just work on the popular vote. The presidential election is the only one that uses the Electoral College. Um, now, to win a congressional election, uh, there's a couple of things that make those candidates more likely to be successful. Uh, one is incumbency. If you are the incumbent candidate, it means you already hold the office. And so you have a lot of things that come with that, whether it's support, money, uh, you have a clear record, you have name recognition. All of that makes you more likely to win re-election. It's much harder for a new challenger to come in and beat an incumbent candidate. Uh, incumbent candidates also have staff support. They already have a staff in their office that can help work on this process. They are visible. You know, they do lots of speaking engagements, appear in the media, community events, and things like that. Um, so they have that advantage over their challenger. And then there's what we call the scare off effect, where um, sometimes some elected officials have just been in office for so long and have so much influence that nobody runs against them because it's just there's just not the belief that anybody could beat them. This would be someone like your, uh, you know, like John McCain. John McCain um, was a senator for around 30 years, and it was just because Mc McCain was like an institution. Uh, Ted Kennedy was like this. Uh, Bernie Sanders is kind of like this in, in Vermont. Uh, people don't challenge them simply because these candidates have just been there for so long. They're kind of like institutions. Um, when an incumbent loses, it's usually due to a few things. Redistricting, the, the voting lines have been redrawn, gerrymandered to weaken their position. Uh, they've been involved in a scandal or what we call presidential coattails. So when a new president comes into office, a lot of times if that candidate is very popular, they will carry other people from their party into office as well because people will say, well, if I'm voting for a Democrat for president, maybe I should vote for Democrats in other offices and vice versa with Republicans. So this is what we call presidential coattails, that a popular candidate can, can boost the popularity of a party and bring other members of the party into power. Midterm elections, like we had in 2018, <clears throat> this can sometimes be what we call a referendum on the president. So Donald Trump was elected in 2016. When we hold our midterm election in 2018, Sometimes the president's party will lose uh, seats in Congress and things like that because people are not happy with the job the president is doing. And this is, this is fairly common. But uh, if you look at 2018, in 2018, Republicans lost control of the House to the Democrats. And a lot of people said that this was a clear message that the voters were not happy with President Trump. And so uh, this... <clears throat> the midterms, presidents tend to, their party will tend to lose some power and influence. So, <clears throat> what are some things that are indicators of how and why people will vote? One, party identification. If someone really identifies with a party, uh, like they care enough about the election to be like diehard devoted to a party, uh, they're probably going to vote. Um, ticket splitting is when people are open to voting for people from either party. So maybe you like a Democrat for this position, but you like a Republican for that position. Those are more of your moderate voters. Uh, ideology kind of goes hand in hand with party identification. We know Republicans tend to be more conservative. Democrats tend to be more liberal. Um, income and education. This one's important and will apply to y'all. Um, the more highly educated someone is and the higher their level of income, the more likely they are to vote because educated people understand how elections are going to affect them. Um, but if we look at kind of a separation in the classes, people who are in a lower income bracket tend to vote Democrat because Democrats support social programs to help the poor. Uh, the very wealthy tend to support Republicans because Republicans favor lower taxes on the wealthy to allow them to keep more of their money. The middle class is kind of the toss-up and where elections are decided. 
Uh, race, and, race and ethnicity, there is historical correlations between race and party affiliation. Uh, the Republican Party still today is overwhelmingly white. Um, and if we look at Democrats, uh, African Americans and Latinos tend to have a historical lean towards the Democratic Party. It is definitely more uh, apparent with African Americans, uh, but Latinos have started a greater shift to the Democratic Party because of issues like immigration. Um, gender. Uh, nationwide, women tend to lean Democrat. Now, that will vary state by state. If we look at Texas, that may not be true, but nationwide statistics show us that most women in the United States identify as Democrats, men tend to lean Republican. Um, religion, there's been some toss up in these. Uh, Protestant Christians still overwhelmingly identify as Republican. Uh, Jewish people historically identified with Democrats, but because of the issue of Israel, uh, and the stance that President Trump has taken, some Jewish people have started to move a little to the right. And then Catholics are kind of split uh, based on what issues they care about, especially things like pro-life versus pro-choice. Um, but those are our three largest religious demographics in the United States. Um, and then re retrospective judgment and perspective judgment kind of determine how a person looks at the election. Retrospective judgment is when you're judging a party that's been in power based on what they've done. And this is typically what happens in midterm elections uh, or if we have an incumbent candidate. So like with President Trump, people are going to look at the past four years and decide whether he has kept his promises and done a good job. With Joe Biden, they're going to use more perspective judgment, even though he's been vice president. Um, and Senator, do they believe he's going to be able to do what he says he, he wants to do? Uh, you know, how much do they trust him? And so that's kind of two different ways people look at candidates when they're deciding to make to, who they're going to vote for. Voter turnout. So this may actually change this year. Historically, voter turnout has been low. Um, the voting age population is everyone who's over the age of 18 and eligible to vote. Only about 58% of eligible voters turned out in 2012. 35% of voters rarely or never vote. Now, from what uh, you know, they're saying in the media this year, more people have registered to vote this year than any other time in 100 years. So this could be the year that breaks this cycle where we have record voter turnout and you can definitely, you know, assume that this is because of President Trump. People are either very motivated to vote for him or very motivated to vote against him. So this election, people are predicting we will have the highest voter turnout that we've had in 100 years in our country. Um, I'm going to skip these other ones because we already talked about these. So this is looking at, you know, this isn't quite up to date, but this chart here on the left, uh, if you look at, um, this is voter turnout, um, I'm sorry, eligible voters uh, in 2004, 2008, and 2012. We can see that people who are eligible to vote that in the demographic of African Americans, we're seeing a slight increase every four years. Uh, in white citizens, we're actually seeing a slight decrease every four years. And then in Latinos, we're seeing a significant increase uh, every four years. It's going up more than a percent every four years, and whites are decreasing more than a percent every four years. Um, at the top, we see Asians and other, and those are increasing, but smaller increases. And then looking at this, you know, Millennials and Gen Zers are, you know, increasing their turnout, increasing uh, in registration. Um, you know, millennials are the only group here that increased uh, leading into 2016. All the other demographics actually decreased. And so after this election, we'll have more data about millennials and Gen Zs and how they voted in this election. Um. 
what are some of our problems with voter turnout? One, a lot of people complain that it needs to be easier to vote because people are very busy. People have kids and work and, you know, child care issues and all that kind of stuff that they have to deal with. Um, you know, voter registration could be easier. In some states, you're automatically registered when you turn 18, but that's not all states. But there is an argument that all states could move to that to make it easier. Um, states making it difficult to vote, whether it's like voter ID laws, trouble getting an absentee ballot, which we're seeing this year, uh, inability to be there on election day. Luckily in Texas, we have uh, early voting, but some states still don't. And so trying to get there on a Tuesday is difficult for people. Um, the number of elections, we just have a lot of positions that we have to elect. And so, like I said, people can be overwhelmed. Um, voter attitudes, being apathetic, thinking that it doesn't matter, all that kind of stuff. And then this one is big, uh, not really being connected to or, or liking either party or either candidate. That was the problem in 2016. And some people say that is a problem for them this year as well. So how do we improve voter turnout? One idea that's out there that is getting more and more support is to make Election Day a holiday. Um, give as many people as possible the chance to vote. Uh, early voting, like I've said, in states that have early voting turnout is significantly higher. Um, believe it or not, only 32 states have early voting currently. We still have uh, those 18 states that are still dragging behind. Uh, mail and online voting. I don't think anybody's ready for online voting. We just don't trust the security quite yet. But mail-in voting is that debate that we're having right now. Many states have been doing mail automatic mail-in voting for years and have had no trouble with that. This idea that's been put out there this year that mail-in voting, you know, will increase fraud and things like that. There's just no evidence to really support that. We've been doing mail-in voting, absentee voting and all that for a very long time with very little issues. Uh, like we said, make registration an easier process. Uh, allow people to either automatically be registered at age 18 or allow people to register the same day they go vote or have permanent registration where your registration is never revoked because you don't vote or things like that. Um, modernizing voting equipment. If you, some of you are too young to have voted in, um, you know, elections before this one, but voting equipment is pretty behind when it comes to technology. And so some of it has been upgraded uh, in the state of Texas, uh, but we are still lagging behind when it comes to technology. And then, of course, strengthening party outreach, connecting with voters, allowing people to see that candidates and parties have, you know, are taking their interest and their concerns seriously. All of this stuff can contribute to, to more people turning out to vote.